Hey there, hello my friends. Welcome back, Chris and Angela from the, what's it called? The Dinosaur Omelette. Dinosaur Omelette, welcome. Hey Kelly, who stopped in and then split. Good to see you came in. All right, welcome back guys. It's uh, Thursday, 8 p.m. on the East Coast. It's, what's today, November the 30th. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, it's almost Christmas time. So happy early end of the year and new year. Stopped in and then split. Good to see you came in. All right, welcome back guys. It's Thursday, 8 p.m. on the East Coast. I'm hearing my voice on the playback. Anywho, so what are we talking to about tonight? Some general quail stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing general quail self-sufficiency, quail farming, which is a popular topic and which is going to gain popularity in the spring pretty soon. And, you know, what did we, we did this last week, preparing for spring. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that? What is your input? I don't really have input. <laughs> Do you have input? <laughs> yes, I have input. Okay. It went pretty good. So we discussed uh, setting up for springtime, pre-planning, planning ahead. This is the time of year to do that. I mean, it's, people are getting overwhelmed with Christmas time and holiday time and kids getting off of school. So the last thing people are thinking about right at this time is another huge project. But, you know, like the way we kind of do stuff is don't think of the huge project. Do it increment, incre incrementally. So, uh, you know, earlier in springtime or late winter, you can figure out what you want to do without going nuts because you're down to brass tacks in February or March, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so quail farming. Who wants to be a quail farmer? Why be a quail farmer? What are people doing with quail farming? What are the pros of quail farming? Now, can you define what you mean by quail Raising farming? Raising quail. When people say quail farming, I want to be that quail sounds not commercial, no, yeah. not, not, not large scale. Quail farming at home just for somebody small. When you, well, you know, you have your own little garden. You can be a gardener. Same kind of thing. So you have a small quail farm at your house. Or you're raising quail. I forgot to turn this on silent. Telemarketers. So what is the benefit of the quail farming? Or raising quail? Yeah. Um, or raising quail. Well, it gives you a source of homegrown eggs and you can also um, do meat if you're if you'd like to have your own healthy meat it's a lean type of meat but um, the, the quail they're easy to raise they can be raised in a small space and be very productive with producing eggs um, that can easily feed a family you know day by day um, with how many eggs they like <laughs> Yeah, uh, the quail are, like she's saying, they're popular choice people for people who want chickens, but they can't keep them in the area. We've been talking about this every week. It's kind of redundant for us, but if you haven't been here before, the big pros of the quail, they're teeny tiny, not so tiny that they're not good for meat. They're actually about the size of grapefruit, and they're great meat birds, but they're small, so you can keep them in a hutch. I actually brought in my um, little hutch model to show you guys later. Uh, you can keep them in a hutch, they reproduce phenomenally quickly compared to chickens, like from hatch date mm -hmm. to um, their egg laying is six to eight weeks as opposed to five, six, seven, eight months, depending on what breed you're doing with chickens. So they have a yeah. quick turnaround for egg production. The hatch time, I mean, if you're hatching, it's two, two weeks or so, it's about 17 days, right? Yeah, technically it's, it's 18 days, but if mm -hmm. your um, <clears throat> incubator is... Performing well. Well, be careful. <laughs> okay. Um, then they start hatching on day 16. A lot of them hatch out on day 17, and then 18 is the finish up. We endorse raising the jumbo caternix quails. Jumbo quail. The quail was a bunch of varieties and breeds, but uh, our niche and our specific application for these quail is food production because they are really good food producers. But the breed you're going to want to use are jumbo quail. They are referred to as Faro Brown or uh, Caternix Wild, Wild mm -hmm. or their Latin name, Caternix Japonica. These are their eggs. See, not as big as a chicken egg, a little bit smaller. They're about one third the size of a chicken egg. So, three quail eggs will give you the equivalent of one chicken egg. And a lot of people will say, like, oh, well, they're so small, I don't want those stupid tiny eggs. Well, that's fine. You don't have to have the stupid tiny eggs. But the whole point of the stupid tiny eggs is that you can raise them in a hutch. And, and it's a three-to-one ratio. They lay so... If you have, 
you know, let's say you have um, 20 hens, they're, you're going to get anywhere from 18 to 22 eggs a day, and that piles up very quickly. So um, some people aren't familiar with quail, or maybe they're, they're new, um, they may get slightly hung up on the size of the egg, but they accumulate so quickly. It's, I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> you wind up yeah, start getting yeah, eggs a lot away. of eggs, yeah. Yeah, so that's the other part of this, and we talked about that last week, is uh, planning and knowing what your needs are. Mm -hmm. And usually down in the, um, what do you call it, description of these videos, I'll add links to help you guys figure out how many quail, if you've never had them before, how many quail would be appropriate for your needs. And we usually base that on egg consumption, you know. Oh, I eat... Or our family will eat a, uh, on average six eggs a day or three eggs a day or whatever it is. And that'll give you a general idea of what kind of hutch setup you're going to want or how many quail you're going to want for your hutch. Very easy stuff. Nothing to be intimidated by. It's like I always say, it's like raising goldfish. As long as you have a habitat for them, they're going to thrive. Speaking of habitat, let's take a look. At my wonderful imitation little miniature tiny hutch. So let me show you guys what a hutch looks like. I built this model hutch and I did it on another video earlier. So real quick, I want to do a rundown of these hutches. Our hutches, we have, uh, what is it? Two by four or two by three? It's two by four foot. Mm -hmm. So we have two foot floor space by four foot long, which gives us eight square feet. And the mathematics we use for housing is three quail per every square foot. So a two foot by four foot house will hold 24 quail, because it's eight square feet, eight times three. So that number's around 24 quail, 20, 22, 24 as a maximum. We try not to pack them tighter than that. Some people do, but we don't. So what is a hutch? And I did a huge hutch video a couple weeks ago, which you can look through, but I'm gonna run through this quickly. What are the big issues with a hutch? What's the number one thing we always talk about? Uh, well, it needs to be predator-proof. Predator-proof. And so that means uh, you don't want any holes the size of a quarter or larger because uh, smaller predators can get through a quarter size thing, like minks, rats, snakes, <laughs> and then also uh, larger predators like raccoons, they can stick their hands through the wire and grab the birds and, and harm them. Harm them, yeah, rip off little walking parts in their feet. So predator proofing is a big thing. Uh, we recommend, what do you call it, hardware cloth. Mm -hmm. Half inch square hardware cloth on the top sides and bottom, uh, which will allow plenty of ventilation, prevent predators from getting in, and allow droppings to get through. Now, if the hardware cloth on the bottom of your cage is too small, and it Smaller than the half inch, let's say you use quarter inch hardware cloth, it's going to get clogged up. Yeah, the droppings won't go through. And let's say you want to repurpose an old rabbit hutch. If the rabbit flooring is the bigger kind of flooring, their legs are going to fall through. Mm -hmm. And so, then predators are going to hurt them. Yeah, so you want to be careful with the flooring, especially um, using the half inch square hardware cloth. But even with a half inch, uh, you're going to want to, if you have a raised hutch, you're going to want to have some sort of system to prevent a predator, large or small, from getting up underneath there. And because they can actually pull their feet right through and that's not good. So you can have um, a, a tray or manure underneath um, up close enough at an appropriate spacing to prevent any predators from getting directly underneath the, the hutch or some people want the droppings to just completely fall to the ground which is fine but consider you know what to do with predators some some people might put like an electric wire around the base or put wire you know all the way around so it all just the consider off. the predators are going to get as close as they can yeah and if you do droppings on the ground which you can do which is fine too like she said you can do a tractor system and move it around or just have a, um, a door on the bottom where you can scoop it out and add it to your compost pile so you're not cleaning so much, which is also easy to do. But predator proofing is a big issue. Make sure it's predator proofed. Mm -hmm. Setting up a hutch, you want to have a roof, something to keep the elements off the birds. And what she was talking about over here with the pull-out trailer, if it's not 
free falling to the ground. There's a clean out tray. So you take it out, blech, dirty, slip it back into your rack. And you know, there's not gonna be much space. This thing is not built perfect, but I don't, on our outdoor cages, there's not enough space between the pull out tray and the bottom of the floor, like she was saying, for the critters to get under there and harm them. They're not going to get them from the sides. You know, if you do have a case where a raccoon or an opossum comes out at night, they're not going to get in here, and the quail aren't stupid. They're going to run off, and they're going to seek shelter. Okay? Well, um, maybe. Maybe. They might just sit there. <laughs> they may just sit there, but we um, haven't they, had any problems When with they them. sleep, they, they, they sit down wherever mm -hmm. they're standing. Uh, another, mm -hmm. another thing to consider, too, is if you do have an, an egg rollout, um, with your floor being slanted so that the eggs will roll to the front, making it easy for you to collect the eggs here. Just keep in mind that this gap that allows the eggs to come through can be a, um, a location where predators can sneak yeah, through. Yeah, predator could get in there. So you can do something very simple with putting like a two by four, putting some sort of block blocker there that's easy for you to remove but fasten so a predator can't take it off themselves just to protect the birds. Yeah, so keep all that stuff in mind when you're building one, repurposing an old hutch, when you start looking into doing your quail um, covey. If you have any questions, stick them in the old comments down here or come, you know, see us on the Facebook and send a message because this stuff's pretty simple. And again, like I have a ton of information in the description, which are links to the PDFs we wrote. So you guys can... Uh, get a quick grasp. I wrote it so it's very, very easy to understand all that stuff. It's not a ton of ton of information. It's quick and to the point, so you can read through it and in 10 minutes understand everything there is to know about these birds. The other thing we have on this hutch, and I don't want to talk too much about it, but um, we do have a windbreak or in a little, um, what do you call it, nesting a area, a shelter. So a small portion of the hutch will have a sheltered area where it's there's no hardware cloth on the side or in the back, and they can kind of come in there. And I'll come in and scoop out eggs. In ours, we keep sand inside of the sheltered portion. Because they enjoy bathing in the sand. It's, it's, uh, it improves the quality of their life. Most birds enjoy doing that. Yeah, and they like it. It makes them, makes them happy. So that's a brief overview of these hutch systems. Uh, again... Simple thing to set up if you have any experience with any small animals, guinea pigs or bunny rabbits, then or no experience with animals, <laughs> or no experience because <laughs> we've animals. had people we've that oh, yeah, we have a ton of people who they're haven't brand had. new to animals and they're a good starter animal, yeah, yeah, they are, and they're very again really simple and a lot cheaper than starting with chickens. Um, I posted links to this video in all of the prepper groups on Facebook that I'm in and homestead groups to help educate if any of you guys are watching this because these are really phenomenal creatures um, as a prepper animal because it, you're producing your own food at home, you're becoming more self-sufficient and as a homestead creature because they are great for the kids, they're great for the family. And you can, like we kind of mentioned already, you can reproduce them, hatch them yourself and keep them going. Yeah. yeah it's not... Um, a type of animal that you have to keep buying necessarily keep buying them year after year you can keep it going yourself yeah now shoveling along real quick because in the description if you read that I want to talk about egg production and food nu the nutritional needs of your quail which are simple things egg production we kind of discussed part of it very briefly with avoiding predators a uh, common issue with what well, I guess most all birds is stressful environments. So if you have your hutch set up somewhere and there's a lot of, let's say, uh, spilled food or just whatever, the predators are coming around, raccoons or squirrels, at, uh, not squirrels, raccoons and possums at night, they're gonna spook the birds and they may stop laying. So if And you want... they, they can get um, harassing to the point where they'll climb all over a hutch and they'll try and get at them wherever they can. So that's very scary. <laughs> yeah, especially this time of year. Everybody's hungry. It's cold out, so they need more calories. So uh, the cold will also change the behavior of local predatory mm -hmm. creatures. And so he's referring to the stress of that making them stop laying because laying uh, uses a lot of energy. Producing these eggs is an energy type thing for them. So 
um, yeah, they're in a survival mode <laughs> if they get stressed like that. Yeah, so uh, keeping the stress in the environment stress-free as possible or a consistent environment. You may have like mm -hmm. a dog that prowls around that spooks them, but if the dog's consistently around there, they get used to it. Mm -hmm. And they, they're not going to be stressed by the animal being present. Yeah. Okay, first few times they may be stressed out, but then they become pretty acclimated to whatever their local environment is. Okay. And, and at, like pets that um, pass by once in a while, um, but ignore the birds, that's not really a big deal. It's, it's, it's tends to be when they're being harassed. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff. Or barked at or something. Yeah. So they will start laying again. If they do stop laying, they will start again. But... Um, yeah, different type of stressors. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, even... not, yeah, they're not so delicate like if a predator comes around, bam, they stop laying. Yeah. You know, but it can be an uh, issue with um, instigating their if, laying if to stop. You're, if they stop laying, these are potential reasons as to why. That's right? why. Yeah. yeah. And then also if a stressor could even be not getting enough food um, throughout the day, perhaps some, some people might not realize, some people might just give them a portion of food. Uh, to sustain them for a day, but they really need food constantly, and they'll visit the feeder as they need the food. Mm, they they don't, don't eat constantly. Yeah, they don't eat a serving. They, they just eat a little bit here and there throughout the day. Yeah, yeah. they're different from the chickens. They have very fast metabolisms yeah. compared to chickens, so they do need to visit it you know, throughout the day to keep their, their fast, um, rapid bodies going and fueled. And the eggs that they're producing... Mm. You know, again, it takes energy, so they have to replenish that energy. So you know, they have a smaller crop, which is where they keep their food before it goes into their stomach. They're, they have a smaller digestive tract, obviously, mm -hmm. than a chicken, so they're not going to be ingesting as much food as a chicken. And they run hotter at their temperature. If you have any interesting questions about chicken digestion, <laughs> we did a video on that a few weeks back too, here on the live thing. Um, so predators obviously keep that issue at bay. Mm -hmm. Sunlight this time of year reduce sunlight. Is going to inhibit egg productions they'll pretty much stop actually mm -hmm. once the sun goes down so supplemental lighting little christmas lights or led strips to give as them as long as it's bright enough for you to read a book by it then you know what, 14 to 18 hours of light mm -hmm. yeah total including direct sunlight or you know yeah anything. so you want to add extra light at the beginning and the end of the day to give a total of 14 to 16 hours or so of light to the birds mm -hmm. um, in the winter and fall season. Be mindful as well of where you place their cage or coop, um, that they're not in a excessively shady area because sometimes, um, or even if it's indoors in a, ba in a garage or something, sometimes the shade itself is just not allowing enough light so that can affect the egg production because you might be, well, it's during the day, they can see what they're doing, but you just have to make sure that, yeah, it's enough light. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and proper nutrition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you want to use a use a good mix, a good feed, which you can get. Well, we always recommend using a local feed mill for animal feed because it's cheaper. It's fresher. It's fresher. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's fresh cracked. If it's cracked ingredients, they're fresh cracked. And what we mean by fresher is the n nutrient content content for each ingredient for each grain is it's more full uh the long, the older uh, a grain is that's cracked open or crushed or made into a crumble or a pellet the older it is then the nutrition is going to oxidize it's going to begin to deplete from it yeah it's yeah. just it's like leaving a bag of chips out in the mm -hmm. open or sealing it up okay it's just going to be going bad and the air is going to get to it and deteriorate the um Nutrients, particularly fats, you know, they break down really mm -hmm. quick, but also vitamin A and some other vitamins break down quickly. So your local mills are really a great source, and it's, it's your local business, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we say? Predators, lights, nutrition for egg production. Mm -hmm. Obviously, consistent water, nice clean water at all times. And it's an issue this time of year because it's getting colder, so things are starting to freeze. And I think next week we're going to be talking about winterizing everything. Mm -hmm. But um, I think, is that about it? Oh, molting. Okay, what is molting? The birds, they're going to lose all their feathers, or most of them. A lot of them. A lot gonna, of them. They're going to flush out feathers in the fall in, uh, according to the seasonal change. Mm -hmm. Now, you can trick them with 
supplemental light, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, I always remind people that like we're in, um, we're in Pennsylvania. So September, about September is for us when we, we definitely have to make sure that the lights, if we're going to have extra lights, that they're there because if we don't, they'll go into a heavy molt. Um, and it, you, they still have a lot of feathers on them. It's just that in the, in the flooring, you're going to see a lot of feathers. Um, and, uh, then when they do that, that uses a lot of energy. Oh, hey, Aaron. <laughs> hey, what up, um, Aaron? To grow new feathers. So if they're doing a heavy molt, they're going to stop laying because that also takes a lot of energy. So if you don't uh, do anything to affect a heavy molt coming on, then they could potentially stop laying for a month, two months, um, until that whole process is completed and then they get back on the their schedule, <laughs> the routine. Um, however, if you do add lighting, which we recommend, um, then they will still molt, but it'll be a lighter molt, um, and they'll still lay eggs through it. The egg count might drop a little, but then it, it'll be, they'll complete their lighter molt faster, and then the egg count will pick back up much faster. Yeah, I think the last thing to discuss with egg production is if they get sick. Is there an illness going around the hutch? So keep an eye out for the birds if they're starting to look not well. Their energy's decreased, you know, maybe they're laying on their sides and they look unhealthy. They may have, you know, what's common with bird illnesses? Um, well, um... Co we, coccidiosis, yeah, coccidiosis it's, it's not a an, it's a ground thing so that's not really an it's an issue if you have bedding material in your coop or hutch um and it's gross <laughs> it's harboring you know a, a home it's keeping a bacteria and organisms alive um then they could get coccidiosis um but that, and that's really not good at all. Yeah, keep everything <laughs> clean. You don't want them getting yeah, like kidney clean. worms or any of these things. So keep everything nice and Generally, clean. Generally in a raised hutch, if they're in a system that's off the ground, they should pretty much be healthy. Um, but like Christopher mentioned earlier, make sure their nutrition is proper because that's going to affect their energy output and production overall. Um, yeah, and, and then if you're using a sand or some sort of material for, a, a, for, for them to bathe in, just make sure it's not overly dusty because birds are prone to respiratory illnesses. So if they're inhaling something that's super dusty, uh, then that you, they can end up with um, breathing issues, watery eyes, different complications, which will, of course, affect their production because mm -hmm. now their body is... Them. New to quail people, keep this in mind, that's why there's so much open space in here. You may look at this and be like, oh my god, aren't they going to freeze to death in winter? That ventilation is very, very important. Mm -hmm. So uh, Aaron, he's watching us from down south. It doesn't get mm -hmm. too cold down there, but it gets mm -hmm. pretty chilly up here. I don't know how cold it gets down there. I imagine they have some chilly nights. But um, even when it's super freezing out, the birds are fine. They have their feathers, they have their high metabolism. They're going to huddle together. And we do recommend keeping some kind of a windbreak, even if you don't have an, in, an enclosed area. Mm -hmm. Do have, maybe wrap up part of the sides, but keep it ventilated. Yeah, so according Ventilation. to where you're from and how harsh your winters are, because of course there are people, I mean, there's people in Alaska who have them, but they have to keep in mind their environment. So. Uh, they, you know, if, if you have really harsh winters or expect an unusually cold uh, spell, then just like Christopher said, give, you know, add a little bit more reinforcement um, to the sheltered area to, for wind breaks. Uh, we also have on the um, sandbox area for ours, we have an optional, um, like a plastic material that we can move um, back and fold forward or just like have half the top open yeah. or, or an additional and cover. We can snap it shut if we need to if it's super cold but you do have to we don't have it permanent because um if maybe like the next two nights suddenly are a little warmer they they're they run hotter like we mentioned yeah. already and they're going to be panting if they get slightly warm um and they'll huddle together and when they do that the area is going to get damp and um, you might end up with condensation yeah. on the ceiling, and that'll that's just you don't want dampness. <laughs> yeah, so like in the winter time, 
you know, we don't think about in the summer, but you see your breath in the winter, but that happens all year round. When you respirate, every breath, there's moisture coming out. So then you got 24 little uh, birds. Everybody's in the shelter. You got 24 <laughs> little dudes sitting in there, running really hot because they have a high body mm -hmm. temperature and high metabolism, and they're all going like this, because <laughs> they breathe fast. Mm -hmm. breathing out a ton of moisture. And like she is saying, they're respiratory issues, man. So that moisture, if it's condensating in a totally enclosed box, it's going to wet their entire bedding. Their bedding's going to be mm -hmm. saturated just, just from the, their breath. The air. It's going to get humid. Yeah. yeah. So you want that ventilation. That's an important thing for anybody new to these creatures. We always try to stress that, like the predator thing and the ventilation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they can, animals, birds, it doesn't matter, not just quail, but birds will die in an enclosed area if left alone in there just, like just from breathing. Yeah, well, overheat. So that's why if you have something that's optional mm -hmm. and controllable, like what I was saying, something mm -hmm. you can close some of it if you have an open top or close all of it and, you know, or open it completely. Just gives you options. Yeah, and in the winter, um, just, the freezing issue is not a big thing. The birds do huddle up. One thing I want to show you guys if you're building hutches at home and putting a roof on it, it's like an idiot when I built my first one, I didn't make the roof long enough to where the drip edge went past my um, Feeder. feeders. So it'll, it'll kind of lift down and drip on there a little. I don't have a, a gutter system or anything. But also on the back is the J feeders. So any new quail people, you want to have, it would be advisable to have a feeder system you can get to that's on the outside so it preserves yeah. their floor space. And it's also easy to get to to fill. Yeah, and if it can hold, you know, more than one day of feed for them, oh, then that just makes it Let me get something. I have a show and tell. Quicker I'll be right back. View. And there are different types of feeders and waterers out on the market uh, these days. Um, the important thing is to find something that works for your setup um, that doesn't waste food. And what I mean by that is um, they tend to pick through foods and they just use their beaks and pull a food toward them as they're hunting obsessively for different things and as that as they do that it can spill out and onto the floor so you want to make sure you have some a system that that doesn't waste the food for you my show and tell today kids <laughs> is fresh butchered quail i actually just did a couple today because we had some extras but these were males that we had roosters here's a, so this is the quail fresh fresh butchered ugh, they're kind of wet but i just come out of the fridge so you can see there you know, the breast is, it's pretty significant. It's there's kind of hard to see. Meat. It's not bad. Either. But it's, you know, it's a thick piece of meat, and you do have these legs. It's kind of hard to see two-dimensional on a screen. But the little birds are not that little mm -hmm. once you cook them. I would say one or one and a half, two of these is really plenty. It's plenty. Mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah, with having a side um, vegetable yeah, or something. Yeah, jam one of these on top of rice or something mm -hmm. with a little veggie. One or two of those is fine, and you're getting a very significant portion of protein yeah. for your body, and it's good healthy meat. But, yeah, I just butchered these today. So if you're wondering what a butchered quail looks like, I took the skin off, gutted them. Yes, there are no wings. I clipped the wings off. There's not a lot of wing meat on a quail wing, right? Mm -hmm. I'll set that aside. It won't go bad for a couple minutes. Well, I can take it for you. Okay, she's going to take it for me. All right, well, I think that is going about um, kind of go through. I think we're almost done here. I just wanted to get through with you guys who are new and curious about these creators. Can you raise them at home? Are they easy? Yes. And we do these videos quite frequently to address especially new people and answer any questions. And also other quail people, you know, they're bored and they want to get online and see what the other quail people are up to. This is what we're up to, talking about quails. <laughs> and it's getting toward New Year, and there's a rush for all kinds of animals in January and February in that late winter, early spring. Everybody starts ordering everything. Mm -hmm. They're anticipating spring. Yeah, and that's the other reason we... Oh, and also the holidays and stuff. Yeah. Distractions are over, and there's, what am I going to do They're now? bored, and the kids <laughs> are sitting around making noise, so they're like, okay, what are we doing? Let's get ready for spring. That's right, last week we discussed preparing uh, your quail covey, kind of planning it now, because everybody's going to be in the same mindset. 
in a few weeks after holiday time when it's let's order stuff let's see what they order and then you get those problems with back orders mm -hmm. and then instead of getting something in a week you're waiting a month and a half and that's not good okay because we, we we get we get back orders once mm -hmm. it's busy here mm -hmm. You know, people yeah. start ordering quails, and they keep calling and asking. And the best is when they order a lot of stuff and then cancel at the last minute. That's always fun. <laughs> Just we always, kidding. We always get people there. Yeah, yeah, but somebody always takes takes a um, takes the order. So when we get canceled orders for uh, the chicks, we always have the backup people who are waiting in line. So it'll just go to the next person, mm -hmm. and we'll call them and be like, "Yo." You want your critters, we can get them to you this week. Somebody cancels. And if not, we move to the next person. Somebody always wants them in the spring because it's busy time. So if you're planning on doing a new animal or upgrading your current facilities for your current animals, like now is kind of really the time to plan it. Late winter time before the rush starts. And then in early spring, all the box stores, they mark everything up and put a slash through it and mark it back down to the original price and say they're having sales. So the sales come up too um, at the beginning of spring. But uh, quick tip, if you are thinking of doing animals and looking for hutches or stuff, this, you know, get onto the Craigslist and stuff now because people are selling everything to buy Christmas junk. Mm -hmm. so or just kind of to clear out their yeah, properties. Yeah, they're clearing out. Mm -hmm. So now is the time. <laughs> I remember remember everybody was looking for hutches when it was hard to find hutches and you couldn't even find a rotten piece of wood. <laughs> like I think mm -hmm. it was during the COVID stuff. Probably. Yeah, you mm -hmm. couldn't find anything. Everybody was going nuts. But, um, you know, even in spring there is a rush for hutches. Like everybody's looking for chicken coops and you can't find them because everybody's buying them all. Mm -hmm. So now is the or time Or the prices are higher with the demand. It's common economics 101, man. Supply and demand, and demand comes up pretty soon, and then there's scarcity. So, do what mm -hmm. you need to do to get started. Questions, comments, stick them down in the bottom. Be happy to address those. Uh, appreciate anybody who's watching tonight. Aaron, thanks for stopping in. Kelly, I know you were in here earlier. Any last words, dear wife? Um, no, except for I mean, we really we love our jumbo quail. They're just one of the most productive and efficient um, animals because they're small but they're so productive with meat and eggs and you can affect the quality of your food you can have the just I mean the quail eggs in general have a few more um, extra nutrient um, things that chicken eggs don't have um, yeah. they're they are healthier for you there's a higher nutrient density in the yeah. in the quail eggs and they are quite volume. tasty it's not like a it's not a huge obvious um taste difference but the, it does taste i mean we think it's tasty yeah, chicken eggs. but anyway tasty. um you know what um what happened with the eggs you know they weren't the eggshells when such weren't bleached um that I mean eggshells are porous so, um, you know, they're not in a factory somewhere getting all kinds of weird Chemicals. contaminants. Yeah, they wash them, bleach them, and recoat them. Yeah, and you know if you're raising the meat, you know it's, it's healthy meat. You know, there's not a bunch of antibiotics or hormones or, you know, all kinds of weird stuff in it. Um, you know that your animals are raised happy um, and well. So, and, and you can continue to produce them. So, it's, it's just very satisfying. Um, they're easy to manage um, and you can adjust numbers as needed and if your desire to have more um, if you want to fill your freezer you know you can have a meat plan with meat mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's just yeah it's it's a really versatile animal so we really I really like them a lot we yeah. and we have different types of animals um, on our homestead um, but these ones are the most um, Prolific. Yeah. They produce phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Really good. But whatever you guys are doing, you know, quails are great, bunnies, chickens, goats, mm -hmm. depending on what kind of land you have. Getting started in anything, raise a garden in the spring. Definitely a good idea to have a layered system if you can, which is everything Christopher just mentioned. Um, the If you want to get started with the quail or if you get started with a different animal, mm -hmm. then once mm -hmm. you feel really good and confident about it, add another animal or add another, like a garden space or, or potted vegetables. Um, 
and it's just having a, a layered system will give you very a varied um, meat source or egg source because like duck eggs are different than chicken eggs and chicken eggs are different than the quail eggs. Um, there are similarities, obviously, but rabbit meat rabbits is a clean, lean meat that is versatile, like chicken meat, but they're and cute. It's white meat, and you can use it in different things. But um, yeah, if you have, then you can. Um, cook different things like the quail or ducks for example um you know that's like a delicacy type or a fancier meal in a, in a restaurant so you yeah, remember quail <laughs> quail under glass i remember that from the 1980s it was a, like a delicacy quail mm -hmm. under glass you go to the nice restaurant mm -hmm. but um yeah any of these foods i think the core philosophy that i kind of endorse isn't oh hey i'm gonna save money or oh hey i'm gonna make food it's I'm going to improve the quality of my life by endeavoring in an activity I haven't done before. I'm producing something. I'm making, through my physical efforts, I'm producing a commodity that is becoming actually part of me. I'm going to eat this thing, and I have an intimate understanding of the life cycle. So it's rewarding on multiple levels. It's not just, hey, I have eggs in the fridge. <laughs> okay? It's a rewarding experience. It's a skill. Yeah. Individually, for, the, for family, for children, it's... It's more than uh, just a simple input to output transaction. There are several steps. There's learning curve. There's the satisfaction of trial and error, of failure and success. And uh, with the quail, you get that. Like with any kind of um, food program you're doing at home, the garden, of course, it's a complicated one. Gardening is not easy, but it's rewarding and you can learn it. Mm -hmm. So. That's more my thing with the quail. Yeah, you're going to be raising good quality food, but it's it's a satis satisfying experience overall because you're 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 actually creating something, okay? And you know, you know the old story, the kid who's given the um, brand new sports car by dad, or then there's the kid who worked his back off to get some beat up piece of junk car. Which kid appreciates their car more? Who's more proud of their car? Yeah, the one who broke his back to buy some piece of junk car because mm -hmm. it's an extension of himself. And that's kind of what all this stuff is. So I don't really get into that hokey dokey philosophical stuff, but. Um, but quality of life is a big deal. It's an underlying. Mm -hmm. And uh, daily, your, your daily quality of life. It's not necessarily, some people will think about, oh, you know. There's all these people who focus so much on eating well and exercising and then, oh, we know so we know these people who died early in life and like why bother well it's it's not necessarily about when your day is it's about the quality of your of each day yeah. so when you're feeding if you when you're eating well eating food that you're you know is it's healthy it's good for you you're feeding that to your family and then you're also moving moving your body um you know if you're uh, pursuing exercise which is very good for your body then the, then you're going to feel good you're going to be energized your brain is going to be getting what it needs and you're going to have um, just motivation and drive and the quality of each day is going to be more satisfying that's correct man i agree with that i'm i'm for the now we're starting to ramble because i was going to end this but <laughs> no it's all right um there's there are the people and uh, we like to think it's kind of an elitist thing, the self-driven individual, and that's not exactly correct. I think the self-driving behavior is a condition and learned um, behavior. So you can see somebody who's not doing much, you're like, oh, he's lazy. Well, that's not really necessarily true. He's a human being, so human beings are capable of almost anything. It's encouraging and initiating action, motivating action in the unmotivated individual. Stuff like this, is self-motivating. Oh, I produce something, I feel better, I do a little more. I produce more, I feel even better, I do more. And it begins to snowball, mm -hmm. okay? And then even the hiccups don't destroy you. Uh, sometimes if you have a bad mindset, something, you, you, you break something, wreck something, uh, forget it. But with these kinds of things, you know, we encourage a mindset that is uh, resilient. And failure is not a stop. It's a learning point, mm -hmm. okay? And that leads to satisfaction of life. And like she said, I always tell you, tomorrow track the trailer may decide to take me out. But that's okay because I lived well today. Yeah. You know, it's not my call. So live well each day. Be happy each day. Be nice to other people as you can each day. 
and eventually all that ends. We all have the same destiny, I guess. All right. Anyway, make your own food, grow your own quail. Give us a call if you have any questions. Leave a comment down at the bottom. And next week, I think we're going to talk about winterizing your critters' hutches and areas mm -hmm. so you're not going nuts with everything freezing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is that it? Yeah, I think so. That's it. Thank you for stopping by. Anybody who stopped by, we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye.